Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Online Federal Science Agency's update. For a little bit of background on the group that puts together the update, the Government Information Committee is part of the Science and Technology section of ACRL. The committee focuses on the intersection of science and technology and government issues. I'm Britt Fagerheim, an instruction librarian at Utah State University. I'm one of the co-chairs of the committee, along with Andrea Wirth, the scholarly communication librarian at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. We've been hosting a face-to-face -face federal science agencies update at the midwinter and annual ALA conferences. And this is the first year we've moved to an online format for the winter presentation. We're transitioning to an online format, both due to the anticipated changes with the midwinter conference and also to enable more participation from those interested in government issues around science and technology. I'll introduce our three speakers and then we'll move into the presentations. Our first speaker will be Mary Moulton. Mary joined the National Transportation Library in 2011 following a career in academic and private sectors. NTL is a virtual library. Rosa P, NTL's digital repository, serves as a central clearinghouse and archive for publicly accessible transportation information, including federally funded research results, statistical data products, and other information needed for transportation decision making. As digital librarian, Mary leads the development and enhancement of digital repository services, information organization, digital curation, and discovery and use of NTL resources. Mary is the co-chair of SENDI, an interagency group of senior scientific and technical information managers from 14 United States federal agencies, and she's co-chair of the Science.gov Alliance. She has a BS in plant science and MLIS from the University of Rhode Island and an MS in entomology from Kansas State University. Our second speaker is Cynthia Parr. Cindy is the data policy analyst in the office of the director, USDA ARS National Agricultural Library in Beltsville, Maryland. She currently serves as the Acting Assistant Chief Data Officer for the Research, Education, and Economics Mission Area of USDA. She focuses on open data, open science, and data science. Dr. Parr received a BS in biology from Cornell University and an MS and PhD in biology from the University of Michigan. Third, we'll hear from Catherine Funk. Catherine is the program manager for PubMed Central at the U.S. National Library of Medicine. She's responsible for PubMed Central policies, as well as PubMed Central's role in supporting the public access policies of numerous funding agencies, including NIH. Prior to coming to NLM, Katie worked as an academic publish in academic publishing, most recently at the American Psychological Association. She received her master's degree in library and information science from the Catholic University of America. So I will stop sharing my screen and let Mary take over at this point. So you can go ahead and share your screen and get started, Mary. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you great, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, okay, thank you, thanks. Um, hello, uh, everybody, uh, I'm so happy to be here today and to talk to you about what we're doing in the library and I'm having a little bit of difficulty <laughs> right now trying to show this and, uh, uh, there we go. All right, today I'm gonna to talk to you about our uh, repository and open science access portal, which we call uh, Rosa P. As you heard, um, I'm the digital librarian here at the National Transportation Library. 
and we are an all digital library. Uh, uh, we were founded uh, in 1998. We're administered by the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. And our, uh, our um, mandate is to support digital collections, data services, to provide reference and research services, and to provide support for transportation knowledge networks. We're an open access digital repository and all items are in the public domain and available for reuse without restriction. Just a little bit of interesting information about our relationship with the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. At the time that we were founded, the statisticians were mailing out on CD-ROM and in print format um, their uh, reports and data products um, that, you know, their statistical data products. So the reason why we were founded was so that we could firstly be the central repository for um, transportation statistical information and that people could come to us for that information. Um, since then, our mandates have expanded. So we were founded in 1998 um, to provide national and international access to transportation information. And then in 2012, our mandate was expanded further with legislation so that we would be a central clearinghouse for research results, data, technical publications, and also coordination of the Transportation Knowledge Network. And lastly, we're operating under the 2018 Foundations for Ev Evidence-Based Policymaking Act. And this has a lot to do with how we're making uh, data available. Just a little bit about USDOT's public access policy. We developed our plan in 2015 and it went live in January 2016. So we are celebrating the fourth anniversary of our uh, USD public access policy actually right now. And this is to ensure that the public can access scientific research results and also provide access uh, and uh, reliable preservation of USDOT funded publications and data sets. We also accept final peer reviewed manuscripts and we will embargo those for 12 months. So that's a very short version of our public access plan. And I put a link here in the publication. Um, I'm assuming that you'll get a copy of the slides at the end of this. So you can go to our website and read more about what we're doing with public access. The National Transportation Library actually has a really big role to play in public access because we're the place, we're the final destination for all of the research results. And the other thing that's really interesting that we do is, and it's in our plan, we provide a searchable database of data management plans. And this has become very useful uh, to researchers that we fund internally and externally because they can see how others have put together their data management plans. And it's not such a big hurdle for them then or so intimidating um, to put together a plan. This is what the front page of our digital repository looks like. And um, this is uh, pretty current. Uh, we uh, are able to highlight uh, um, current research on the front page. We're able to search across all collections, search within collections, and we also have an advanced search. A little bit about our repository. We uh, are in partnership with the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, and they developed a Stacks platform uh, that's based on um, Fedora. Uh, we moved all of our content into uh, the cloud. Uh, we have uh, two backups now for our content. And uh, we're, in addition to being partners with uh, CDC, we are also in partnership with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration they also use the Stacks platform. We migrated two years ago, and the whole reason for doing this was because we wanted to be able to impl implement public access 
And specifically, we wanted to be able to link data and publications and provide a total package of research results uh, on one page to the uh, user of our system. And that has definitely been enabled by Rosa P. And in moving our content, we also at that time revised all of our metadata so that we would better be able to accommodate public access documents and also do what I said, link publications to data. So we've been successful in that um, regard. Uh, a little bit about our collection. We're a full text digital archive. We cover all modes of transportation. We currently have about 50,000 digital objects. We are in the process of migrating 70,000 uh, digitized uh, legacy documents into the repository that will take place over the course of this year. Um, most of the born digital objects were submitted to NTL by content creators or owners. And these are people that we partner with and fund people who do research. And the rest of the material uh, is reborn and um, uh, that's digitized usually uh, through contract at the request of NTL. We use a digital submissions uh, email box and we uh, take submissions from uh, within USDOT and those are agencies like the Federal Highway Administration, Federal Aviation Administration, you've heard of them. Uh, we also collect at the state, metropolitan, and local levels. We also partner with university transportation centers. And on occasion, we receive material from the private sector as well. So that's all really important to public access because we uh, fund uh, agencies at all levels of government. So in moving to public access, uh, we implemented identifiers in our cataloging records. And the two identifiers we are currently using are data site and ORCIDs. The ORCID identifier is required of researchers um, who receive grants from us. That's part of their contract with us. And we assign data site digital object identifiers to every USDOT report and data set. Uh, we also are um, uh, assigning uh, digital object identifiers to uh, the initial um, award that's in our research in progress system so that we can track the research that way. And that's part of this whole public access initiative. Um, one of the other things that we've started doing in our repository enables this. Uh, we're getting very good metrics from CDC for views and downloads, among other things. So uh, we've actually developed a dashboard so that um, users can come to the dashboard and they can manipulate the data. Uh, so for example, a researcher would be able to get um, data just around um, his or her particular uh, article or item or set of items. This hasn't been made public yet, but we expect this to go public this year also. Um, I mentioned about the data management plans. And the best thing about Rosa P is that the content is indexed by Google, Google Scholar and also a transportation um, bibliographic database, WorldCat, and science.gov. Um, our, um, <clears throat> a little bit about uh, how we are implementing this. And um, uh, uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about um, success and how we are measuring this. So um, this year, uh, this past year, I'm sorry, we're in a new year, but um, at, at, in, at the end of fiscal year 2019, which would have been um, the end of September, uh, we had spent the whole previous year engaging with researchers across USDOT because their research falls under the plan. And we, had, we collected any research that had um, started in 2016 because that's when our implementation went into effect. That's when the plan went into effect four years ago. So we had a fairly decent success rate. This was a lot of work um, going around the agency and 
um, working with the researchers to find their reports. We had records of the research that we sp that was sponsored, <clears throat> but it was a little bit of an ordeal to identify all of the researchers and go collect the final results. A lot of the different um, operating administrations, they manage their research results in their own databases or on their own computers, so it was really all over the place. The majority of the modes are in compliance. We do have a few groups of researchers that we're still working with, but we feel really good about this. Um, the other thing that we've done, I mentioned about the digital object identifiers. We are assigning those now at the very beginning of the research process in our um, research in progress database, which is called Research Hub. And we are developing a research portfolio management system. So that, that should be really helpful moving forward to help us track compliance. As of today, we have approximately 835 projects that we're tracking in our research hub. Um, the really wonderful success story is uh, working with our colleagues here in the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. We are up to date with all of the reports and data products, and they've all been ingested in Rosa P and cataloged. And um, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, we're very happy that that's accessible to the public and our colleagues are very happy about it as well. Lastly, we had to make our report recently to the um, uh, uh, GAO about how we are implementing public access. And the recommendation that they made was that we establish a working group and we did do that. In the fall, we established a public access implementation working group. And so that group um, is working uh, to develop a compliance mechanism. And that would be for all research, external and internal. And we're also going to update um, USDOT's public access plan. Now, I, didn't ha I don't have any information in the slide about compliance with, with external researchers. And that's because we have only just started to get those research results in. The plan covers research that was funded starting in 2016. So these, these projects have some longevity. We expect that we're going to be really dealing with that this year. So um, uh, there'll be an update. <laughs> there'll be an update on this. But we've been engaged with uh, folks at the state DOTs and at the university transportation centers. And so we feel really optimistic that we're going to have um, very good compliance with the plan. Future improvements include um, for Rosa P additional citation export formats, an audio video viewer in the platform, canned searches. I mentioned the metrics dashboard. We are going to be making public a form-based digital submissions form. That'll be an electronic submissions form. We think that that will really enhance our workflow. And we're also working with our partners on trustworthy repository certification. So that's my uh, presentation in a nutshell. And um, I invite you to contact me uh, if you need additional information. Can people see my screen? Okay, I uh, am Cynthia Parr, and if everybody can hear me, I'll proceed. I don't hear anything, so I assume it's my turn to go. So yes. I'll be talking today about USDA's 
public access policies, its platforms, and some of the services that we're providing at the National Agricultural Library to support public access. And uh, because Mary gave a little bit of history about her library, I just wanted to mention briefly that the National Ag Library was created in 1862 in legislation signed by Abraham Lincoln. And since then, we've been building a very large and unique physical collection um, of materials relating to agriculture around the country and the world. And that collection is increasingly digitized and we have informational websites, reference services, very typical library services. But in addition, we also serve a coordination role for those land grant institutions, universities, and their libraries and their librarians. And so we have a excellent network of agricultural and data librarians around the country that we work with that I will mention later. So a little bit of the policy background. Uh, it dates back to 2013 and this kicked off all of this public access activity. Uh, the Holdren memo was released by the Office of Science and Technology Policy back in the previous administration. And that was followed quickly by uh, executive orders for open data and in particular machine readable open data that applies largely to government produced data. Um, in 2014, USDA uh, had its implementation plan approved for the Holdren memo requirements. And then following that in 2016, our Science Council of USDA, which includes representatives from all of those agencies within USDA that fund scientific research, uh, they approved the public access policy for scholarly publications. So we have always uh, realized that providing access to publications is uh, essential and also not quite as complicated as providing access to data. And so we got that scholarly publications policy out relatively early, but we've spent a few more years working on our policies for digital scientific data. In 2019, as Mary said, the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act became law in January while many of us were on furlough. And that essentially uh, provided not just uh, executive uh, mandates, but also congressional requirements for making uh, government data and government funded data accessible to the public. Um, in 2019, just this summer, we finally were able to get Science Council approval for our public access policy for digital scientific data. And so we're in the process of rolling out implementation of that policy. And I should mention that the next steps at USDA for uh, policy are to combine the scholarly publications and the scientific data policies into a single departmental regulation and that will underpin our ability to enforce these policies for our extramurally funded uh, researchers. So first let me cover what the policy for scholarly articles requires. Authors are to submit to the USDA public access archive system, final manuscripts that are peer reviewed, that are accepted for publication in a journal, and that arise from USDA funding, whether that's a grant, contract, cooperative agreement, or uh, for those uh, thousands of uh, scientists that we actually have working here at USDA uh, from intramural funding. And that public access archive system is called PubAg, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but the policy also uh, provides for an up to 12 month embargo following publication. Now, this, I should note, this, this policy requires the final manuscripts to be submitted. And those manuscripts are the versions that were accepted for publication, um, which therefore has the same content as the journal published version, but it doesn't include the publisher's copy editing, stylistic or format editing edits, which would be the final version of record that appears in the scholarly journal. And I should mention that when a publisher does provide free access to the version of register, this is considered the, the best available version of the articles and PubAg will link to that. So here's a screenshot of our PubAg 
uh, website, which you can find at pubag.nal.usda.gov. Um, we have focused to date primarily on submission of those accepted manuscripts from our internal researchers, our intramural researchers, and submission of those accepted manuscripts by external researchers is not yet possible, but our uh, submission system is, is in the works and, and so that's pending. Um, in the meantime, we have an agreement with Chorus that does provide those click-through links to their version of uh, the published, the journal versions of the, the uh, version of record. Here's an example of a pub ag catalog entry. And as you can see, there's a link in the upper right where uh, users can download a PDF of the copy that we have in pub ag. And there are uh, mechanisms to click through that DOI to get to the version of record. Standard bibliographic metadata on these. All right, so let's switch now to the policies on data public access. Um, similar to most of the other agencies that are uh, required to have a policy about providing access to public data, in uh, as this policy is being implemented, all project proposals will need to be accompanied by data management plans. The data will need to be made available in a machine readable format in a repository that's capable of assigning a digital object identifier and long-term preservation. In addition, we're asking that all of the published data be cataloged in NAL's Ag Data Commons. And so that allows us to collect some standardized metadata even if we do not actually hold the data in our repository. There's clearly a lot of uh, existing databases that a lot of this research is already being managed in and we don't want to uh, duplicate the effort of, of those ongoing uh, databases and so but we do want to know where the data are and so uh, we're asking that metadata be uh, submitted to the Ag Data Commons. Data will need to be available within 30 months after the completion of data collection and that completion date is to be described in those data management plans. Agricultural data is very uh, diverse and there are going to be different practices for different disciplines and different experimental plans. And so it is up to those data management plans to describe for that particular project when data collection is considered complete and then the clock will start ticking. And then finally, uh, as Mary indicated, we are also requiring uh, ORCIDs and digital object identifiers so that research projects like papers and their data can be linked to each other. All right, so the Ag Data Commons is our uh, catalog for all of USDA funded research data. This is hosted here at the National Ag Library. We are doing our best to be fair compliant bindable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And we're also ensuring that all of those open and machine readable database requirements are, are being met. We do harvest metadata from related repositories. So for example, I think you're going to hear from NIH next. We are harvesting metadata from uh, NCBI bioprojects because a lot of our researchers are collecting genetic sequence and they're depositing it where they should in GenBank um, and other databases. Um, so our scope for this repository spans everything from agricultural economics to genomics to uh, animal products and, and uh, nutrition and health. And so it's a very wide uh, span of topics. Um, however, we are very clear that this is a uh, collection of data. We're not looking for copies of figures or tables that are already in manuscripts that are that are highly summarized data and not the raw data. The data have to be related to agriculture and at least for now they have to be USDA supported. Um, 
that includes uh, projects that are either funded directly by our extramural agency or collaborations of our intramural research with uh, either contractors or uh, collaborators at universities. And I've just listed very simply here the steps required for submission of data. If you're going to house it directly with us, you create an account, you complete a data submission form, you upload your files, and then you submit it for review. And I want to be very clear, we have a staff of data curators here who are there to help researchers make sure that the metadata is clear and as comprehensive as possible. Um, and this is true, actually, whether the metadata are for files that you're going to upload to our repository or you're pointing to a database or a repository elsewhere. Here's an example of a data set that we are currently holding, and I just want to show that uh, there's explicit licensing on every data set, so it's clear how it can be used. And uh, in addition to the downloadable files, which in this case include a Excel spreadsheet, they also include uh, non-proprietary formats like CSV files in different units. And we're also encouraging people to uh, include a data dictionary that really spells out what all those variable names are and what they mean uh, that will be accessible for the future for uh, follow-on projects, both for humans to read it and also potentially for programs to be written to help integrate the data. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So this is a brief diagram showing that uh, on the left, there are actually these pre-existing networks and repositories and databases that we are harvesting metadata from. And in addition, if, if people don't have a, an obvious place for their disciplinary data, they can deposit it with us. If the data are large, over 20 gigabytes, let's say, we're uh, preparing to get that stored in association with our high performance computing network storage, that's SciNet. Just as Mary said, we're linking the data with the articles in PubAg, and we're tagging it with our controlled vocabulary, the NAL thesaurus. And uh, one of the main functions of the Ag Data Commons is to take that standardized metadata and make sure it gets to the places it needs to go. So we're uh, feeding data to data.gov where appropriate. We're indexed by science.gov and Google and uh, making sure that the data are available in uh, profiles of researchers at ORCID, for example. So one thing that's not on this slide, but I want to mention is that uh, we are in the process of building additional tools that will leverage the data in this repository, things uh, like using machine learning or natural language processing to identify related data or to highlight or identify data that could be integrated for larger studies. And so we're, we're planning to use this platform as a starting point for enabling uh, bigger, better science. I just wanted to put a special call out here for what's happening at the National Institutes for Food and Agriculture. This is the part of USDA that funds the extramural university research, and they are requiring data management plans for almost all of their programs as of uh, the last fiscal year, and those data management plans are required to, to describe what they're doing to what projects will do to comply with public access as part of their overall data lifecycle management. And just a note that the new terms of awards as these projects are, are being uh, awarded also note the requirement to deposit scholarly articles in PubAg. Um, and that link there is a pointer to the information available at NIFA, including um, the uh, frequently asked questions and a training video. All right, we were asked to talk a bit about compliance rates and like the Department of Transportation, this is a hot area of activity right now. So far, we can say that we have more than 200,000 full text articles available at PubAg uh, going back even before the uh, public access requirements kicked in. And on the Ag Data Commons, we have more than 2,000 catalog records uh, and more than 4,000 files that are actually directly updated, uploaded to the Ag Data Commons. And stay tuned for more detail on this. We are forming a task force uh, for all the agencies at USDA that uh, generate research results so that we can figure out 
how to determine what the denominator should be to figure out what our compliance levels actually are. This is a challenge in the internally uh, funded part of USDA. We have 800 projects alone every year, and that's not counting all the extramural projects and what those expectations are for their uh, public access compliance. So this is an active area of research. Other things that we're doing at the library to support uh, public access and data management are holding several workshops that are funded by NIFA and that are bringing together librarians as well as researchers to consider what are the best practices in particular areas of research. This, this meeting was in 2018 and it was primarily focused on agricultural economics and dairy agroecosystems. And then last year, uh, we brought people together in Virginia to uh, talk about these issues and particularly reach out to our cooperative extension uh, researchers and faculty. And we brought in some agricultural lawyers and drone researchers and uh, entrepreneurship officers of uh, universities. And so um, this is an ongoing effort. There is a new workshop that we hope to, uh, well, that we are organizing for this summer having to do with on-farm data ownership and privacy, particularly with respect to the relationship between researchers and the farmers whose uh, farms the data are collected on. And then finally, just a note that at our library, we're offering data management planning services. And so we invite people to submit to us before a research proposal is submitted, a copy of the data management plan, and we'll provide feedback to hopefully improve it. We're also encouraging people to uh, take advantage of the resources at their own universities for their libraries. And on this website, under our data link here, we have a checklist for uh, reviewers to use as they're evaluating those submitted data management plans. That checklist is fairly general and it could be used by anybody in any discipline. So I'm happy to have anybody uh, use that and also give us feedback for how to improve it. So with that, I'll say thank you. And here's the links again for our platforms, PubAg and Ag Data Commons. If you have questions about the Ag Data Commons, we have a curator inbox listed there. And if you have any questions about our policies, that's my email address. Thanks very much. Thank you, Cynthia. And Catherine, you can go ahead and um, share your screen as soon as Cynthia's unshared and get started. All right, thank you. I've stopped sharing. Okay. All right, are we ready to go? So um, I'm gonna assume so and just dive ahead in interest of time. Um, as Britt said earlier, my name is Katie Funk. I am the program manager for PubMed Central here at the National Library of Medicine at the National Institutes of Health. Um, as my role indicates, I definitely have more of a publications uh, background as far as this is this public access conversation is concerned. But as no one can really escape talking about data, to, um, I will I will try to represent. Uh, the current state of data science at NIH, as well as uh, public access to publications. Um, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone on this presentation that NIH has a longstanding commitment to making research results and accomplishments available to the public. We've been doing this for decades now. Uh, PubMed Central was launched as an open repository of journal uh, content in 2000. And I just had a data sharing policy since 2003 that applied to large awards. The NIH public access policy, which we'll get into more, was passed in 2008 by Congress. Uh, and in 2015, the NIH genomic data sharing policy, which applies to large scale genomic data, um, was implemented. And I think the most recent sort of data e policy that was uh, applied is the dissemination of NIH funded clinical trial information. There was an interesting article in Science about this policy and its success or lack thereof so far um, that I encourage people to check out. It published this week. Uh, so my focus today is really going to be on the NIH public access policy and PubMed Central. I'll look at the NIH strategic plan for data science, which is really not to be confused with the draft for NIH policy for data management and sharing, which I will touch on, and then sort of look ahead. 
Uh, we were asked to also incorporate where librarians can get involved in this. Um, I will try to do that as I go, but I think in general there's just a need for so much education and so much of this is new. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of interesting opportunities as we go through. The NIH Public Access, I, I assume many of you are familiar with. It's been around since 2008. It applies to all peer-reviewed articles accepted for publication um, after April 2008. And um, it requires that they be made publicly accessible in PubMed Central within 12 months of publication. The idea being this advances science, this improves human health, and this returns tax funded research to the taxpayer. PubMed Central uh, is the National Library of Medicine's full text database of scientific journal literature. It is an XML database, so we, we have HTML rendering as well as PDF and PubReader rendering. Uh, it provides a permanent central searchable archive of scientific findings, and it's really been a representative of a successful public-private partnership since it was uh, conceived in 2000. A lot of its success has to do with our relationship with publishers as well as our relationship with funders. PMC Today is both a journal archive, so we have these sort of established agreements with journals that they say we will archive the complete contents of our, of our publication in PMC, and those, the, we have over 2,500 of those uh, sorts of arrangements in place. We're also a funder repository, so in cases where we don't get a paper directly from the publisher, we may take the author manuscript through our NIH manuscript submission system if it's been supported by one of our funding partners. There are six, this is a graphic that I put together last July. Um, there are now nearly six million records in PMC. Uh, about two thirds of those are coming in under those uh, relationships that we have with publishers that I mentioned previously. It's about 700,000 manuscripts that have come in in support of public access over time. And then we also have a very uh, robust uh, historical scanning project, which is what represented by the digital content here. Um, PMC is accessed by about 2.5 million users on the average weekday, and they're generally um, looking at about 5 million articles. In addition to supporting the NIH public access policy, PMC does partner with a number of other funders with the goal of simplifying this as much as possible for, uh, for your researchers so that if they have co-funding, we can find ways to make sure that they're only having to do uh, one submission or, or the most two. Um, we, in addition to that, we work with a number of private funders through the Health Research Alliance, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and about 30 European funders with our partnership with Europe PMC. As far as compliance with the NIH public access policy, it, these days it hovers at about 89 to 90%. Um, there's generally about 100,000 to 115,000 articles published annually that are supported by NIH. And last year we hit a milestone of um, making accessible 1 million of those articles uh, through PubMed Central and they've been accessed a billion times. So we see this really as an indicator of the success of the policy and its value to the public. Of those million articles, approximately 60% uh, were deposited through our manuscript submission system. So if you're working with researchers and trying to guess uh, which way they're going to come in, quite frequently it is as a manuscript submission. Uh, NLM is very invested in continuing to support manuscript submission as a way of complying with public access. And to that end, we are releasing a new NIHMS system next week. Uh, hopefully you've seen one of our announcements if this impacts you. Um, if not, uh, you can check out the NCBI Insights blog. There's also a YouTube video that is linked from the NIHMS homepage. Uh, I encourage you to check it out and see what's changing. We're really excited about it. The other resource that we make available that I think is of real value to libraries is the Public Access Compliance Monitor. And this only covers NIH funded research, but it gives you an institutional overview of the compliance status of the papers we know to be associated with grants made to your institution. It has a web UI and API access, and you can get downloadable status reports, although I think the only ones people generally care about are the, the non-compliant ones. I, I don't think people are downloading their compliance 
reports. And it's been a popular resource amongst librarians that support public access and have a high number of NIH funded researchers at their institution. To that end, uh, we are in the process of reconceiving the public access compliance monitor and seeing how we can serve the community better. So if you're someone who currently uses it and would like to give us feedback, or if you're someone who's tried it and it didn't work for you for some reason, uh, we'd love to hear about that as well. So uh, you're welcome to contact me directly or I have the, the PubMed Central uh, generic email address up here. It'll make its way to me regardless. Um, so shifting gears, the NIH strategic plan for data science, and this is slightly different than a data sharing policy. The focus of this one, which was released in June of 2018, is really on modernizing NIH's data management sharing infrastructure. It was kind of an idea that we need to have the infrastructure in order to have any sort of sharing policy. There were five goals. Uh, first, that that infrastructure be efficient and effective, that we can modernize the ecosystem, to support the development and dissemination of data-related tools, enhance our workforce, and enact policies that promote stewardship and sustainability. The issue that we've been grappling with, and I think that has led to NIH being slower in releasing a data policy than some other funders, is that it, it's a very large institution. It funds across a number of disciplines, and some of those disciplines have very established data sharing cultures. They have very established data uh, repositories, and then there are others that, that may have that less so. And how do we come up with a policy that serves everyone? And, and there's opportunities here, I think, for libraries to get involved. One way that NIH has responded is by uh, initiating a pilot with Fig FigShare. Uh, this is sort of in cases where there isn't necessarily a discipline-specific repository for you, NIH is offering this generalist repository. It is an NIH repository, it's not a FigShare repository, so I think that's a, an important distinction. Uh, this FigShare instance will accept data sets, audio, video, and image files, as well as code and software. It's not intended for preprints and posters or the sort of thing you may just put into regular FigShare. There's a QA of the files and the metadata that is done prior to public release to make sure that it is the sort of content they want to have there, but is that the metadata is meaningful as well. Should NIH decide to discontinue the pilot, um, it's important to note that the archive will persist, either in its current form or it'll be migrated to an NIH repository. PMC has not escaped the wonders of, of data sharing. We find that a lot of data is shared actually with the article. And to that end, we've been doing what we can to increase the findability and expose the data sets that we have. Um, already in PMC. Uh, highlighted here in green is our associated data box that we released in November of 2018. Um, and that really kind of, we, what we do is we go into the full text XML and we identify the supplementary materials, any data availability statements, and any data citations. And we, we bring those to the top of the article so that we can ensure that people are discovering them. We're also investigating what data is shared with articles and how, and what we can maybe do to either improve the practices around this or um, encourage greater sharing in, in data repositories where the data itself can carry its own metadata. We do continue to try to build links between the publications we have in PMC and the data sets that may be elsewhere in public repositories as we feel um, to be able to support reproducibility, having the, the link between the, the methods used and the data found is, is really critical. So last month, we actually implemented in My Bibliography, which is sort of our resource that NIH researchers use to report um, the products of their award as far as publications go. We added this link data set option where they can put in a unique ID for a data set, and, and that will be downstream to PubMed Central eventually. This, this feature is really only available, though, to NIH awardees at this point. So just looking ahead, I, I feel as if there's a, people are fairly comfortable with where NIH has been on public access to publications, but there does seem to be a shift kind of happening right now. Um, so we're seeing a number of initiative level efforts to speed public access to publications and data. So you may have heard about the cancer moonshot policy as well as the HEAL initiative policy. And both of these are sort of 
looking at really high profile issues such as cancer and the opioid crisis and saying that the publications and the data we fund in these areas should never be embargoed in any way. And they're still kind of in the process of being implemented, but I think it really shows where NIH is trying to move here. And NIH is also looking to maximize the impact of interim research products that are developed with NIH funds. And these really, they include a number of things, but for our purposes today, this also includes preprints. So NIH's position on preprints is that awardees are encouraged but not required to post them. Uh, again, they're not required to cite them as part of their grant applications, but it is a, an option available to them. And they don't fall under the NIH public access policy. When it comes to figuring out uh, where to post, um, how to post, NIH has made a couple of expectations of publicly available. Um, some of them are obvious, such as the preprint should be publicly available, it should acknowledge NIH funding. Um, NIH would like to see that this, the work is clearly states that it's not peer reviewed. Um, all COIs or competing interests are flagged. And then um, there's this idea that where, where possible, it be made either available under Creative Commons uh, with attribution license or a public domain license to allow the most possible reuse and, and really drive uh, the value of NIH research and how it can be reused. The last one is to choose a repository that follows best practices. I think this is an area that's still going to need uh, to evolve over time. I don't know that there are a lot of best practices established for preprint repositories, but there are a lot of conversations going on in that area, and I, I feel like it's moving in the right direction. Finally, uh, NIH released um, in the fall the draft policy for data management uh, and sharing. And so this is just a proposal at this time. It would cover all uh, research funded by NIH, so it wouldn't be just genomics or just clinical trials or just things that cost a bajillion dollars. It's everything. Um, researchers would be expected to submit and comply with a data management and sharing plan that would outline how their data will be managed and shared, but it does allow for restrictions or limitations um, in cases where they don't feel that the data should be shared. Uh, failure to comply with the approved plan may affect future NIH funding decisions. So this is very much in line with what we do right now with public access to publications, where if you have papers that are not in compliance, um, funding may be withheld for a, a period of time. Comments on this draft were due on January 10th. I'm flagging a few that may be of interest to this group. Uh, ARL posted theirs last week. Um, AMIA posted theirs earlier this week, and, and you can probably guess by the title, they're not totally pleased with it. So I think there's a lot of interesting perspectives, and I, I think how NIH responds to these will, will be an interesting thing to follow. So those are my quick and dirty updates. Um, I'm putting my email address here because I know a 15 minute update is very hard to touch on any everything. So um, please feel free to follow up with me directly with any questions you may have. Uh, so with that, I think I'll stop sharing and we'll do questions. Yes, hi everyone, this is Andrea. We will um, do questions. A few came in throughout chat, but if you have others, um, please do type them. We have just a few minutes, but I think we can get through a few. Um, while people are thinking, uh, one of the questions was whether the slides or the recording would be shared, and yes, you will get a, as, as long as you registered, you will get a link to the webinar afterwards. And along with that, there will be um, an evaluation that Britt and I and the rest of the committee would really appreciate folks filling out. Um, someone asked a few minutes ago if there could be just a brief explanation of what Figshare is. So I think that was directed to you. Um, sure, yeah, um, I will do my best. Uh, Figshare is really <laughs> and I'm not a representative of Figshare, so I apologize if anyone on this call is and I get this wrong. But I see it as a repository for almost anything. Um, it's, it's really a great way of making, in general, if you go to the sort of broad Figshare, you can make posters, you can make 
your data, you can make slides, you can share a whole range of things. It gets a DOI, it gets its own metadata, and it serves as really this generalist open repository. What NIH is doing is saying, we like this idea, but we really want to focus on, on data, and we really want to make sure that we hold the data, not Figshare. So Figshare is sort of, it's, it's a, a private, um, independent company, and this is just a collaboration or a partnership that NIH is piloting to leverage some of the infrastructure to provide that sort of generalist repository. And while that's not a great response, um, I encourage you to go to their website to learn more. Um, as you were talking, there are a couple other clarifications about Figshare, um, maybe just super quickly. Um, if there's an evaluation plan in process, and I apologize if you said that and I missed it, and the curating of the deposits in Figshare. Sure. Um, so I will be the first to admit that this is somewhat outside the scope of what I do. I assume um, there is a, an evaluation plan, um, but I am not privy to it. Uh, that being said, Figshare did do a presentation this morning, which was actually like, what is what does the NIH Figshare pilot mean to librarians? Um, it was an open presentation and I believe it will be posted um, publicly. And I really encourage you to check that out because it, it covers um, a lot, it goes through in more detail sort of that QA that I was mentioning where they're looking at the metadata, they're looking at the files, does the metadata describe what is actually being provided and, and is what's being provided in scope for uh, the, um, the repository. I don't believe they're providing like peer review level QA of it as to whether the data are accurate. It's more just, um, are we supporting the FAIR principles? Are we within the scope of what NIH is trying to do? Okay, great, thank you. So a uh, question for anyone, and maybe uh, Mary or Cynthia could chime in first. Um, do any of the agencies have policies on how the data must be licensed? Um, and if not, are there any trends on how uh, researchers are licensing their data? So this is Cynthia. I will answer that question. Our policies do not specify any particular licenses. However, they need to be freely available for use. And the uh, requirement for reuse is actually set up on the Ag Data Commons. So we have a list of open licenses, all of which would allow some level of reuse. And so, uh, again, policies don't specifically state licenses, but we are doing our best to encourage Creative Commons licenses and other open licenses, and that does seem to be working. Right. Um, hi, this is Mary. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, uh, uh, the um, NTL and USDOT policy is very similar to AG. Uh, we are not requiring uh, or enabling licensing, but what we are asking and enabling is that people cite uh, specifically the data sets and at the data set level. We're trying to socialize people to doing this. It was part of the issue with us making sure that every data set has a digital object identifier. And we are also um, putting a recommended citation uh, with our data sets. Uh, we really do want to enable citation and that's probably the biggest effort. Um, uh, we are uh, also encouraging um, open licenses, uh, the Creative Commons. And we're talking about the um, uh, Creative Commons uh, public access license. So those are the tools that we're, we're using. Great, thank you all. Um, we did get a few more questions. Unfortunately, I don't believe we have time to address them. Um, I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us on this first uh, virtual Federal Science Agencies update. And um, for those of you that attend uh, the American Library Association annual conference, we are going to have an in-person Federal Science Agencies update. We do not yet have speakers for that. So um, again, there will be an evaluation uh, link included in the recording to the webinar uh, email that you get. So we would appreciate getting um, ideas and suggestions from folks as well as a, an evaluation of this. And again, thank you very much to our three speakers. We very much appreciate your time.